Michael Outram, thanks very much for joining us on our Tech and Sec Weekly with My Security TV. It's my pleasure to be here, Chris. Uh, Millipol and TechX Summit uh, Asia Pacific uh, here in Singapore. Uh, as Commissioner of Australian Border Force, it's one, it's good to see you here in Singapore representing Australia and flying the flag, uh, so to speak. Uh, maybe the premise for you being here, I believe you've got a panel today looking at the threats and challenges uh, for protecting borders, but I, th I suppose the outreach uh, sort of role that you uh, have here in terms yeah. of international policing? So firstly, we've got a very close relationship with Singapore. Obviously in our region, Singapore are a real leader, particularly in sort of the technology space through HTX and, and the Australian Border Force, we have a close relationship with HTX because they represent the, the Immigration Checkpoints Authority and, and, and the home team agencies. So we've been doing quite a lot of work with HTX over the last couple of years anyway in relation to border modernisation for both travellers and for goods. Yep. Um, and you know we've been doing a lot of thinking around the emergence of AI, the technologies that sit under AI and how those technologies can be used to deal with the paradox which we deal with at borders which is increasing volumes and velocity of movement of people and goods yep. and the incremental increases in risk therefore and how we can treat those through technology rather than the idea that we just employ more people because that's yep. not realistic. I think one thing I find with border control, it seems to be at the forefront in terms of advanced technologies due to the numbers involved of people travelling yeah. and also the economics of making sure that people can travel seamlessly and smoothly. Uh, I suppose, and that's one of the challenges of border, uh, border control uh, in Australia, being an island. Uh, yeah. You've got all sorts of uh, ports uh, active. One of the takeaways I took yesterday was moving into the future to QR codes and actually putting the passports aside completely. Is it something on the radar that, uh, or the roadmap, I suppose, for Australia? Do you think uh, Singapore mentioned by 2026? So yeah. do you think by 2030 it'd be something that would be almost standardised? Yes, yes, I think that contactless travel is feasible and in fact we're piloting right now in Australia contactless outbound smart gates. Right, yes. Um, we're doing that with airline crew to just, it's a proof of concept trials, it's early stages for us. Whether the technology ultimately is a biometric QR code or other, other form of you know standard is yet to be determined. The international standards are being developed for, for QR codes but we're actually looking at an enrolment model where your face is your passport. Yep. So there are different models evolving and, um, and no doubt Singapore will be in our region a first mover, but we are already in Australia trying those technologies. I suppose the other one was uh, ASEAN, the ASEAN region, how much contact you have not just with Singapore and via HTX, but ASEAN uh, generally, do you find it something that you're working regionally oh, for Southeast yeah. Asia? Incredibly closely. I'm currently the, the vice chair for the World Customs Organisation in the Asia Pacific region, for example, yep. 33 countries. So I work very closely with the heads of customs in all of those countries. Plus we are, of course, in Australia, a dialogue partner for the ASEAN nations and, yep. and I every year get invited to attend as a plus one the ASEAN heads of customs. And, and the Border Force were also ostensibly Australia's Coast Guard, so we're the heads of Asian Coast Guards yep. that we're also a member of and we represent at. So we have very deep connections operationally across Coast Guard, Customs, Immigration, Homeland Security agencies, and we're very connected. And I would say that you know, HTX in Singapore is one of our more, more advanced relationships. We've got MOUs, we've got established friendships, we, we know each other, we work well together yeah. and we understand each other's capabilities. Is that what you find, given you, because again reading your antecedents, you're a cadet as in 1980 uh, in the UK police, so uh, you know, I'm sorry I had to give you, a, and disclosure, we were both at the Australian Crime Commission uh, together many, many years ago, many some years 20 ago. plus years ago, Yeah. and given your experience, do you find that something with Border Force and the, the role as Commissioner, you're, you're dealing with an established force within Australia but the outreach of the role is completely different from what you might have found with traditional policing uh, as well, the, the international yeah. nature of it? it? It is different because in the border force in Australia we're an integrated border agency. So when I go to other countries I generally have to meet a lot of people. Yeah. It's both a blessing and a curse. <laughs> yeah. um, it's a blessing operationally because I believe that the border is actually a system and the more you can look at the, the system through the lens of threat and risk the better, um, but the, it's not a curse, but it means that when I go to some countries I have to meet head of Coast Guard, head of Customs, head of Immigration Compliance Enforcement, yeah. head of Customs Enforcement, head of somebody else, head of somebody else, and, and on it goes. So I, I do a lot of meetings internationally to try and bring the border protection piece together, and, and there is a, a touch point with our policing colleagues of course in law enforcement, but by and large we try and stick to our lane 
but we do, I do engage with, for example, the FELEG and the Five Eyes policing chiefs around yeah. trade-based money laundering and those sorts of cr more cross-cutting areas of organised crime. The police lead the fight against transnational serious organised crime, but we can, we've got a big dog in the fight. Yeah. Um, do you find yeah. the model is unique in terms of your, the Australian border force? Is that model separated to customs and the like unique, do you find? It's not unique. Um, I'd say that there are other organisations that are, are somewhat similar. So the Canada Border Services Agency, I would say is quite a, quite a similar construct to us. The UK have, have, have sort of played with those constructs, if you remember. Um, you've got Border Force now and HMRC, but there, there have been variations on a theme in the UK, and a lot of other countries are really interested in it. What I would say is there isn't a one-size-fits-all. Yeah. You know, in Australia, we've got 33,000 kilometres of coastline, 10.2 million square kilometres of exclusive economic zone in the seas and oceans around Australia that we have to look after. A lot of international seaports, airports, and we're an island continent, as you said. So our situation, with a population that we've got of under 30 million, compare yeah. that with the United States, yeah. um, you know, a population of over 200 million, or, or with Europe with over 200 million, yeah, et cetera. So it's not a one size fits all. For the US, Customs and Border Protection is an organization of 50 or 60,000. If you added the Coast Guard in, if you added you know, immigration and customs enforcement, if you added Border Patrol in, it'd be almost unmanageable. Yeah. Um, so it, there isn't, I don't think, a one size fits all sort of approach, but I do believe for Australia, integrating our border functions is efficient. I think it gives us economies of scale. It allows us to be more agile in terms of dealing with threats. I suppose that's the good segue there to the current threats, but also the challenges. Technology here at TechX Summit, uh, opening session yesterday on AI and, yeah. and the like. Uh, and again, the numbers uh, of that, so that's involved with, with sort of a role like uh, protecting a border. Where are you, what would be your, your sort of sit rep with, uh, with technology and your role? How much is it on, on, the, on the sort of the desk for you constantly and what would be some of the lead advancements that you're seeing? Yeah, it's a really good question. So we're, we've been spending the last two years laying the groundwork for a new targeting model for the border called Targeting 2.0. Targeting's traditionally been around, you know, which container we're opening, which parcel or packet we're opening, which passenger we're intervening with at the border. Uh, we, we look at the border as a continuum. We have to work offshore with our partners. We'd rather intervene offshore and prevent people and goods getting to Australia before they get on an aeroplane or yeah. on a ship. Uh, so there's a lot of work going in that space and, and at the border itself. And the targeting 2.0, we've been trialling AI. So for example, we created a fusion team two years ago with, um, with you know, data scientists and in, you know, IT engineers and, and, and operational people, bringing that know-how together and we've been trialling machine learning, creating algorithms uh, and models around post-detection analysis. Yeah. We're, we're creating a library now of images of our x-ray detections and misses. Yeah. Yeah. Now we haven't yet got the data stack to use that, but we know we will have. So, so ultimately all uh, sort of x-ray images fed into a data lake. You've got it. And, and learning what's what's uh, sort of a red flag and what's not. Yeah, and we're tagging those images now. So, they, so they'll be yep. usable as, a, as, a, as learning data for uh, you know, it's machine learning algorithms. Yep. Um, and so we're already laying the ground for the future and targeting 2.0 will allow us to move from just looking at containers and things like that to our end-to-end -end operations. Yep. So you start to look at, move from sort of domain-based targeting to actually sort of the more, more the um, issues based targets, so let's take infiltration of organisations our border. So we start to look at what's the more precise strike operation we can put in place to achieve a, a broader disruption outcome. So AI, machine learning, all these subsets of technologies that sit under it, we've been working with Home Affairs in Australia and we're piloting right now a lot of these technologies so we're ready. Yep. Um, and it's exciting, I think, you know, um, there's obviously a lot of downsides potentially of AI in the future and, you know, we talked about it yesterday, but we're looking very much at how, how can we unleash the potential of our organisation. We know we're not going to get, we know we're not going to get thousands more officers. We know we are going to get a lot more travellers and goods. Yeah. Uh, so we've got to actually find a way through this. And I think that the, the evolution from what we've been calling for 20 or 30 years now, intelligence-led risk-based, we're now sort of pivoting to data-driven and augmented. And you find that you're working with the Five Eyes within that, it's an international, because you obviously you yeah. can't do something on your own 
uh, on an international uh, scale like this? Is it being led by sort of international standards alone or particular groups or is it yeah. more of a five eyes led with this, that Australia fits in within the intelligence side? So it's a very really good question, Chris. So a couple of years ago, I, I took to the World Customs Organisation a proposition that we should operationally do something to look at uh, the infiltration of our supply chains globally by transnational serious organised crime. There's 192 customs administrations in the World Customs Organisation. We're pretty well positioned to have a look at that. And we partnered up with the World Shipping Council and we started to bring in and identify new data sets that we haven't seen before in the supply chains. Yep. So we, we run an operation for six weeks called TINCAN through the WCO. The 63 of those administrations participated. We seized about 100 tonnes of cocaine in six weeks that wouldn't have been seized otherwise. And so now through the B5, we're just in the throes of establishing a pilot, a trial around what we're calling a virtual targeting centre. So acquiring new data sets from industry that we haven't seen before yep. and seeing whether we can use those data sets to make sense and identify uh, lines of inquiry and, and interventions that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. The next stage is to automate that. Yep. So we get automated threat detection rather than humans looking at bits of information and making sense, which is where we are now. But I don't think we're far away from the, the time when we'll ingest those data sets from industry and we'll be able to create the algorithms to be in real time identifying threats. Yeah, I mean, I can see someone walking through a, a sort of a, a, a gate, a customs gate, and the, the system just putting them aside saying, someone's going to come and talk to you. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we'll let them know uh, sort of what the data points uh, and the connections yeah. are before that even happens. Because Absolutely. the scale of this and the numbers alone uh, is beyond sort of a individual human capability. It is, and this is where identity for travellers, identity and biometrics. Yep. A key, you know, people want the uh, the convenience of contactless travel. That's all doable, but we need to be able to use biometrics. In Australia, of course, we use iris scans. We don't use it in Australia. Yeah. Um, but the simple facial recognition is already being defeated by organised crime yep. through their use of technology. So we're, we've got to look really carefully here. And the one point I would make is that as we evolve into this new technological era trust is going to be really crucial you know trust in our security of our systems of our data in terms of how we manage privacy and how we use the information in managing bias all of these things are going to be so important because if we don't bring the community with us on this journey we won't be able to do our job and, and the community will be in queues a mile long so we're going to have to you know square this this sort of yeah. again this this um, circle well, i think it always comes down to convenience as well so convenience over security most people will trust the system if it's convenient and they can just simply walk through i think most of them will will accept that maybe from those that won't uh in what we would generally see as crime and, and transnational organized crime what are the sort of key trends that you're seeing? I mean, even in Australia, yeah. we're still seeing uh, sort of bags of cocaine washing up on the shores of Sydney. Yeah. Uh, so it indicates it's that uh, they're active. Very. Um, but yeah, just the, and I was going to bring in cyber too on how much you see with uh, sort of the cyber crime and, right. and transnational organised crime. But the key trends, uh, given your background and your current role, yeah. that you think, uh, and, and relevant to your role in terms of uh, sort of importation and the like. So key trends. Um, I would say, firstly, illegal or irregular migration yep. is going to be a factor of our lifetime and our children's lifetime. If you look at you know, climate change, you look at conflict in the world, all of those things equals a lot of people being pushed around the world and, and push-pull factors between countries. So I'd say that is, is a key trend that isn't going to go away anytime soon. And politically, a that's a challenge as well. Politically, right? very, very challenging and therefore operationally even more challenging because the margins for error are virtually zero. <laughs> yes. Um, so that's the first challenge. Secondly is, yeah, you're absolutely right, international supply chains and borders have been infiltrated by transnational serious organised crime. That's whether it's, you know, um, at our ports and airports and freight forwarders and you know, it's, it's international, this problem, is yeah. why I talked about it earlier on, and importation methodologies still use containers, they're still using mail and parcels, but you're right, we're getting drops at sea, in some parts of the world you're seeing submarines, you're seeing drones, yep. so we've got to keep up with this, and for Australia with a 33,000 kilometre coastline, those sorts of methodologies are concerning, um, and we can't just rely on, you know, jellyfish and crocodiles to protect us in those part, remote parts. So this is where, again, AI can help us and data out of supply chains. So there, I think the drops at sea, we've seen an uptick in, in recent times and a lot more cocaine coming yep. into Australia. 
unfortunately in Australia, um, we have quite a high uh, ratio of our population who are using drugs and, and that market is there. Nicotine products is another issue for us in the border force, so not just illicit tobacco, but now a ban on vapes. Yep. And coming behind vapes, you've got these patches that people are putting their gums and all sorts of other nicotine delivery methods. And our, our children are being targeted to addict them uh, to nicotine by organized crime. Yep. So we've got to deal with that. Um, and then you've got things like human trafficking and people smuggling. So for me, they're the, they're the big issues that we have to contend with, and they're, they're long-term issues. They're not going away anytime soon. And people talk about you know the war on drugs. I think there's a political issue here about we've got you know a lot of countries are decriminalising elements of, of of you know sort of drugs and those sorts of things. And in terms of social policy, I would say there's a lot of work still to be done on. And take away any philosophical view about decriminalisation. You know, is there an impact then on family and domestic violence? Is there an impact on road trauma and death? Is there an impact on youth crime? So I, I think these are questions that we're going to have to continue to ask. And, and again, building data sets, AI, can possibly yep. help us in the future address some of those policy and social problems through through getting better, more real-time data. Well, look, I think given your background uh, and the, the amount of time you've been in the role uh, and the, the breadth of your role as well, uh, you know, MH17, the pandemic, uh, and a whole host of things given your experience, uh, you know, it's those insights I think are really important. I don't think even a comment from me would be, I don't know if we hear from you enough, I don't think the Australian public hears from the Commissioner of the Australian Border Force oh, okay. quite I'll enough. Okay, on board. It's, yeah, well, it's just one of those things. We see often yeah. you, you, you're sort of in the, in the Senate and the like, but I think, uh, you know, again, the, the critical nature of your role and the amount of people that uh, sort of pass through your gates uh, um, specifically through each day, uh, yeah, I think you have a critical role. So um, Thank you, Chris. Yeah, and your insights are important. Maybe because I'm retiring in November, I can be allowed to be treated. Oh, really, <laughs> I had that as a, a sort of a closing thing. What does the future hold? Before I do that, but really, you're going to retire at the end of the year, are you? Is well, my contract, yeah, I, this, I've, I've had extended once, and I yeah. think that in these roles, this is my own personal view, that'll give me, you know, between seven, eight years in the role, yeah. I think it's the right time for the organisation and for me. Um, yeah. I think organisations need renewal, um, needs a new commissioner to come in, look at things afresh. I think I've taken it to a good place. I'm yeah. happy with where, where we're at. Um, and for me personally, I can't think of anything worse than the idea of tending to my garden and watching daytime <laughs> TV. So, um, well, so I, hope there's I, a so I won't, books be, coming. So I won't be doing that. We've <laughs> got enough stories in the background. And, you know, actually, uh, on reflection, it might not be a, a bad thing if we don't hear from Border Force. It means that everything's running smoothly exactly. uh, and the like. So maybe uh, in contrast to, to hearing more, uh, it might be a good thing when, uh, if you're flying under the radar of the public, then everything's you know, sort of going relatively smoothly, right? No news is good news. <laughs> there you go. Um, maybe one last question. Any takeaways out of uh, from TechX Summit and Millipol uh, for you? Any sort of key yeah. meetings that you have while you're here? Oh, crikey. I've, I've no end of key meetings um, with, you know, Home Team Academy, HTX, Singapore Customs, Immigration Checkpoints Authority. Uh, we got such important relationships with these organisations. I'm spending a lot of time with those organisations talking about things that we're talking about here at the conference. Engaged with a couple of um, people out of industry. Government can't solve these problems on their own. Yep. Massive industry presence here. I think we really have to continue to think about the engagement between industry and government. What I was talking about earlier on, new data sets we're getting out of supply chains from industry, that requires trust. They've got to trust us, we've got to trust them. So we've got to, I think, look at things like authorised economic operator programs in the future, standards around government industry engagement, how do we develop AI? Because we we all would all be looking at the same data. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is important from a point of view of not only Singapore showing great leadership in our region on the technology and AI and what it all means, but how do industry and government really start to rationalise how we work together? And there's a lot of win-wins on offer. You know, I don't think most people I deal with in the industry don't want drugs coming to Australia. They don't want their companies being infiltrated. Yep. They want a level playing field. They want to trade fairly. They want to pay their dues. That's 99.9% .9 of people I deal with in the industry. Yep. And so I think we have to work out how to partner up in a smart way that doesn't offend any of our security protocols and standards, but we can't just keep on doing it the way we've been doing it. Very good. Uh, Michael Outram, the Australian Border Force Commissioner. Great to get an interview with Great you before you again, your career ends. Uh, but I don't know what the title of the book will be, but I do hope <laughs> that one comes out. Thank you very much for joining us on our My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. Been a pleasure.